Hey, you guys, welcome to another edition of Behind the Visual with Mark Hansen. I am your host, lifestyle and advertising photographer, Mark Hansen. So today, my guest is going to be Madison Becker, and she is with Digitas Health in Philadelphia, and she is an art producer there. So I think you guys are going to get a lot of info out of her, especially if you're a photographer or you're interested in being an art producer. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit about how persistence um, on her end, got her the job there at Digitas, and she has been there ever since, straight out of school. So that's a huge deal. Also, going to tell you what she wants photographers and agents to know about her job as a producer, and um, maybe some things you guys don't understand about what producers uh, really feel about photographers and their clients and all that. So she wants you guys to know that. She's going to tell you a little bit about her favorite place that she's ever done a shoot, and this little hint is not in america it's in europe although she seems to love all the places she shot shot in the uh, u.s so and last thing she's going to give us a little story about how on a shoot her hair caught on fire and she ended up having to chop it off uh to her shoulders so stay tuned it's a great great episode and interview and i think you guys will look forward to it uh how hell i'm looking forward to you guys listening to it and watching it let's go with that how about that well again thank you for doing this i appreciate you yeah. to, to do it and yeah yeah what's the deal with um so healthcare they're just constantly what are they doing are they licensing images again and yeah. that kind of thing or what's happening yeah right we've been kind of exploring the the virtual shoot uh, production a box situation. Um, we've been licensing stock. We've been asking photographers if they have anything that they want to submit right. from their personal work that hasn't been used anywhere else that they want to give us exclusive yeah. rights to for a certain amount of time. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're figuring it out. Uh, yeah. Lots of animation projects, I'm sure. lots of uh, motion graphics. To, have you, you actually know, done any stock. shoots with people since this thing started? What? Have you done any people since this whole thing started? Um, like, you know, in studio or on location or anything like no, that? No, we yeah. haven't. We are currently bidding a few projects where that's a possibility, but it's still like, well, what's a backup plan if for some reason we can't travel or, you know, things get shut down again, second wave, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I was supposed to go to Houston. That got shut down. They were going to move it to charlotte where i am and then they the client didn't want to shoot in charlotte because it was a houston based deal so like we need to shoot in houston so that got canned and a couple yeah. other things where we're trying to figure out how well, we can shoot. and was the shoot in houston recent it was going to be in april okay because they yeah. just opened up what, like two, three or four weeks ago yeah so it's going to be in april then they, they moved it awesome. and then um i think they're just freaked out with the way everything is just so it's all picking back up again yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's gonna happen so fast because now I think everyone's trying to play catch up. So it's like, oh my god, <laughs> do what yeah. we planned three months ago in the next three weeks. Right. <laughs> yeah. God. So I'm, yeah, but that's difficult on you how to deal with all that. It's a, a hard balancing act to figure out, but we're doing it. We're I mean, things will happen. I'm sure. How do you like working from home though? At, at first, I, I mean, I'm used to traveling. Probably you are too. Like every yeah. other week. So at first I was going crazy. I was like, I need to get out of my house. Like I've never been home this long ever. Yeah. And now I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to travel. I'm kind of comfortable <laughs> wearing pajamas every day and, you know, wake rolling out of bed and going to my computer. So yeah, yeah that part's good. Although my ass is starting to hurt. I've been sitting in front I, of you know, oh, yeah. lately. Yeah. My back is all sorts of messed up because I don't have like, I, I sit on like a, a porch chair and yeah. I don't have a real desk. <laughs> well, it looks like a cool porch. Yeah, it's pretty what nice. I can see of it. It looks pretty it's cool. It's nice to like have windows and see the world and not be stuck in inside in the dark all day. Yeah. Well, tell me, how did you get started? How did you become a producer? Um, I actually, so I went to school at Drexel for photography. I wanted to be a photographer my whole life. And then by the end of it, they, they never, and this isn't really a shot against them, but they just didn't, they were very fine arts based. Like, okay, you go through this program and you become a photographer that markets themselves and you get work based on your work. Right. And by the end of that, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm ambitious enough to be so forthcoming about myself. Like, I, I don't know if I want to do that. 
It's difficult because um, right? you got that. Because yeah, I always feel like I can't go in and go. I'm a great photographer. I'm the yeah. best photographer you're going to find because then I sound like a complete jerk. And I'm like, I right. It's it is. I mean, it's very that. competitive. There's a million photographers who are also very talented, and yeah. especially like coming right out of school, I was like, oh my god, how am I going to make an income immediately? I'm not. I'm not going to. So the last my senior year, um, Cat, did you ever work with Callie? No. Callie Capodici, she used to be the art buyer here, and before that, she was a PBO for a couple of years. Um, so she was the art producer, art buyer at DH when I was graduating college. And my photography program professor just had a connection. So she came in to actually teach the first course that they offered about marketing yourself as a photographer and, and organizing and curating your portfolio and, and how to network properly to get your work out in the world. And I met her and I was like, well, what do you do? And she told me, and I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And so honestly, I... After I graduated, I just bugged her and bugged her to hire me as her <laughs> assistant. Cause she, she did mention, like, I'm looking for an assistant. And she, that was her mistake because I yeah. just I didn't leave her alone. And then she hired me. And so I was under her for three or four years. And then she moved on to bigger and better things. And now here I am. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. But yeah. hey, if you're that tenacious and staying around top of her, you made a great photographer. You could I know. That's, <laughs> that's the, the fun, funny thing. But I, I really enjoy getting other photographers, you know, jobs and supporting them and protecting them. And that's, I think, the funnest, most fun part. What's your day-to-day kind of like, just a normal day for you? Uh, luckily, now I have a lot of people to help me with, like, stock and fonts and all of the the other things that come along with production and art buying. Um, so now it's, it's really talking about creative campaigns and thinking of how we can produce them and researching different photographers. And now I'm doing video too, which is really exciting. So I actually handle a lot of post-production for that. Oh, that's cool. Side of it, um, which actually fills up more of my time now because most everything these days is photography and video. It's never just photography. Yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of different things in a day. So how much control do you have over, I guess, who's going to shoot it, who's going to do the post on it, you know, the editing, all that kind of stuff? Um, we actually, we're lucky. I don't know if you've ever done business with DH before, but we have our own little post-production house. Um, we kind of function as a, a little production company within the agency. Um, where we have editors and After Effects guys and sound design guys. Um, so more recently, we've been trying to do a lot of the posts in-house yeah. just because it's so much easier for our creatives to like come upstairs and sit with us. Obviously not now, but... Um, yeah. And our, our guys are really talented, so we are lucky that we have that. But sometimes clients and creative teams want to go out of house. So I guess as a producer, we have a significant amount of control of who we put up for the job. Right. Um, usually we give a couple options and the creative team then makes an, a decision. Um, photographers, I am probably unique, maybe not, in I will only recommend people who I trust or who have had good, good reviews from somebody else I trust because we've been burned a few times where like, I just, a production is a big deal and I don't want anyone to have a bad experience. So yeah. I would say I, I am a little bit of a gatekeeper. Um, I love working with new people, but I don't, I don't like attitudes or bullshit or any of that. So I think that's smart though. Cause you never know what's going to screw you up on a shoot. Right. Cause you get and somebody could, who doesn't know what they're doing or pretends they know what they're doing. And then yeah. you show up on the shoot and you're like, Oh shit, that didn't go. And I don't think that they, some people, I just don't think, think about how ultimately that could leave a bad taste in our client's mouth and lose us business. So it's really this long chain of, protection that we have to be aware of at all times, even though like, of course I want to give new talent opportunity and it's worked out many times. Creatives will come to me and say, Hey, I found this person. Can we, can we talk to them and work with them? And we do. And it goes great. Um, yeah. So I don't want to say I'm like, you know, closed book, but I, uh, I definitely have a lot of control over what I offer my teams. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I mean, my, my theory has always been, my thing is always make my job is to make you look good. 
Because yeah. if you look good, then whoever your creatives are going to look good, then they're going to look good to the client, and then exactly. everybody looks good, and yeah. then you guys will want to have me, hopefully, want to have right. me come back kind of a thing. And really, like, it does happen. When, when things go really well and people fall in love with a certain team or a photographer or, or whoever, we, we do. We're really good, and our clients are really good about um, – developing long-term relationships where we go back to those people over and over again. So it is a really good investment to make right off the bat. Yeah. I don't, I don't get the attitude thing with photographers and, yeah. and makeup artists and, and that kind of thing. It doesn't make it's sense. Not worth it. We all have the same, we're all part of the same team. Yeah. So let's just play nice together. Yeah. And, and it's also, I mean, I've had clients where they go, I've heard no known photographers who won't shoot certain things. And the client will say, how about we do this? Like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah, I don't no. Understand that. We're like, paying you to do a thing. Just do yeah. the thing. Shoot <laughs> the stupid thing. If you think it's dumb, whatever. Shoot it and then shoot what you want. Right, well, right. And then they can choose and see if they were right or you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Totally. But, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. But so what's your favorite part of this whole, of being a producer since you've been, how long have you been doing it now? I am now five years, which is hard okay. to believe. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, DH, my favorite right? part is absolutely, yeah, five years all at DH right out of school. I, I mean, I had, I managed a small photo business during school, but this was like my first advertising situation. Very cool. So yeah. Five years. That's I know, right? Good. Um, I, I, obviously my favorite part is travel. Oh my God. Anywhere that I can go to a new city or back to a city that I love, it just makes the experience so much better more unique like I can take my clients out to fun dinners and we can all have a good time and that really I think sets a good foundation for how the set day is going to go because you have that opportunity to to just bond outside of like okay we're just going to pay you to do this job and then we're going to leave like no we're we're a team and we're going to hang out like a team and then I think that really changes the way a set day goes oh absolutely yeah I completely agree have you been any where's like your favorite place you've been or that you would like to go back to and uh, all of them. I love all them all. Them. Um, but I would say my top was Barcelona. I mean, I was I was so lucky to go there for three weeks. You were in Barcelona huge, for three weeks? Yeah. A huge TV job with photography on the side. And, you know, it was like six shoot days, three locations a day. It was crazy and amazing. And I saw so many parts of Barcelona that were so different. Like, it didn't feel like one place. It felt like we were in six different places that whole time. Really? That's really yeah, it was cool. beautiful. Yeah, and the food was really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, that was not a that was not a skinny week. That was a I gained fifteen pounds in three weeks situation. Well, that I means just food was good. So it's yeah, all, no, I don't care. Good. It was great. It was so yeah. worth it. <laughs> right. So what do you do on set when you're there? I mean, are you actively handling? everything that's going on on that shoot and other stuff, or are you concentrating yeah. just on that shoot at that time? It's probably, it's probably a bad habit that I have, but you know, I'm, I'm on set, I'm watching, I'm making sure the creative is paying attention and getting what they want. If they have complaints, I, you know, I you, like shell out the complaints to whoever needs to hear it so that we fix the problem. And I'm running back and forth between the client and the photographer or the DP or whoever it is and making sure everyone's happy and you know, keep things moving. And then at the same time, which I shouldn't do, but I do, I'm, I'm making sure everything else that's going on at home is still moving. Yeah. Because I, you know, I love all my babies. I want them all to be happy and prosperous. Well, yeah, especially I guess if you leave it for three weeks, it's tough to just kind of drop everything. Yeah. Well, and, and like in that situation, we were six hours ahead. So right. I, I worked 18 hour days probably because I would get up and answer emails really early in the morning before we went to set because they were still in business hours back here. And then I would go to set and come back and catch up on emails overnight so that first thing when they woke up, they would have like, you know, my responses and things to move, right. move things along. Wow. So it was crazy, but it, it was worth it. But yeah, it's but this is, I guess the price now. that I pay for getting to work in Barcelona at the, at the, lake and the beach and the mountains and with cheese and ham everywhere <laughs> yeah that doesn't sound so bad yeah, yeah. no sounds, complaint sounds like a nice little gig to have for sure yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of deal um yeah so as for well, shoots like that do you guys 
I'm assuming it's like a triple bid kind of a thing mm -hmm. with everybody. Are you guys getting treatments in from photographers on everything or just a few things or nothing or how do you yeah, guys? Yeah, I would say treatments are, are a pretty big deal for us. Um, you know, you can, you, like I've had people bomb creative calls, but if they can put together an amazing, beautiful treatment that's very clear and concise, they get the job. So it's kind of just like a two, like I don't want um, the only thing to you guys be judged on is your creative call because some people just aren't comfortable over the phone or like it's kind of like a cold call we're saying hey yeah. you have basically no information talk to us about it so i think the creative call is just the first step and and that really allows everyone to digest the situation and put their thoughts in a treatment that ultimately will either guarantee or not guarantee you the job so i think that they're super important and and we always have to triple bid so it's just another opportunity for you to sell yourself above and beyond talking yeah. on the phone. Have you noticed that treatments are getting more in depth lately or are they all staying about the same? Um, I, maybe they are in general, but I always tell my photographers, keep it short to the point and sweet because I can tell you creatives don't spend, like they don't read things. They don't have a lot of time. We're all super busy trying to make this happen. So the more direct you can be while still being thoughtful and and um, acknowledge specifics of the project to show that you were paying attention um, and to show that you know what you're talking about is important. But like we don't need books and we don't need 50 pages of images. Like we can just go to your website if we want to see more than a couple of pages. Right. Do you think those images are a huge part of the treatment as to the photographer getting the job or not as, as say they're all as least as if they're all consistently yeah. concise and they sound like they all know what they're doing do you think that the images that are put in the treatment weigh more than just what they see on their websites i th i think they do only because oftentimes the clients ask to see the treatments before they make a decision and our creative teams know that you like that photographers have a band, you know, like beyond those five images that, that they're showing, they obviously are capable of much more and of translating our specific concept into a beautiful campaign. But our clients, oftentimes, that's obviously why they hire us as an agency. So we vet this kind of thing, but they see it and they're like, well, I don't see the one pose of the one guy like this that I was expecting from our campaign. So I just don't think the photographer is going to be able to do it. And it's like, yeah. Well, no, we know that they will. We know that they're capable. So it's just, they're very literal. So it, I will say it does affect the decision. I remember hearing years ago when I first started, somebody in an ad agency told me that sometimes clients flip through your book and if they're looking for a red shoe to be shot, but your book is all blue and green and black shoes and yellow shoes, they're going to go, well, I don't know that they can shoot this because I don't see a red oh, yeah. shoe in this book. Exactly. That happens almost every time. Well, I don't see the one, I was actually just on a call the other day where the client was like, I don't know why the light would peek through two objects like that. We would never have that in, in our campaign. And I was just like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't. Yeah. We're not going to shoot that. It's never going to look like that. <laughs> so it's just, you know, their job is to make great advertising and sell it and whatever. And our job is to make sure the creative is capable of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I had one client that um, they want everything cropped in camera because oh, yeah. he couldn't see it. I was like, well, listen, I'm giving you a little extra room on this because I want you, if you need it for bleed or whatever you have, she goes, no, 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 I can't, I don't understand that, I can't see that. Right, right. we have that a lot. Um, I don't know, if, and you probably do this, but a lot of times I'll have my Digitech put up the actual layout on the screen yes. and crop it that way so that we can be like, no, no, look, see, we got it, I promise, it's there. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, that was when I was shooting film, so it's a lot better now that you can you can pull right. it. Right, obviously that complicates things. Show it to you. Yeah, yeah. And I get it. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a client who wanted a photographer who famously only shot film and wanted a lot of money, and they were like, "I'm not going to pay for something that I can't guarantee." Walking away from the shoot that we got, we have to wait for it to be developed and scanned and whatever. And it doesn't make sense to me to take that kind of risk. Like, what if we didn't get the shot? Then what? So it's, yeah. 
Yeah, well. At least in pharma. Yeah, the whole first part of my career was spent that way. And the worst part was half the time, the Polaroid was the best shot. You'd shoot the Polaroid. Right. And, and then like, that's great. The film. It's like, well, we can't rise up the Polaroid. Yeah, and you spend all day long trying to recreate that one yeah. shot with the Polaroid. Yeah. But, so the digital is good. I like it. The thing about it, it, it allows me to go to dinner now. Yeah. <laughs> Where before I would. You don't have to go back to the lab. lab. Yeah, I would haul ass to the lab to yep. go ahead and get my film taken care of and all that kind of stuff. When you were in Spain, how much of that? How much downtime did you have? We, I mean, we had the luxury and the budget to give a down day between shoot. There was three days down day shoot. And then I think at the beginning, there was a, a, a bit of downtime in between all the prep because we had so many locations. We didn't want to yeah. do them all in one day. So it was like, you know, we had an afternoon off or we had the morning, a late call time or something. So that was nice. Did you and do then, cool? uh, oh yeah, I went to, um, oh my God, I'm never going to remember the name. There's like these beautiful mountains, um, kind of west in inland a little bit. Um, where there's this famous monastery up in the mountains. Really? It's really hard, but I don't remember the name. But um, so we hiked on our down day in between the shoot days. We hiked all along those mountains and through the monastery. And we went to this like a thousand year old winery that was beautiful. Oh my God, it was incredible. Wow. That's yeah. very cool. God. So have you been anyplace else in Europe or Spain? The only Not for work. No. Um, everything else has been U.S. Uh, LA a ton of times. Portland was great. Um, I love going to Texas to shoot. Yeah. Um, I've shot in Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin actually. Oh wow! So all, all the big ones, and I loved them all. They were all great. Yeah, I've shot in Houston and Dallas, and I like those. I haven't shot anywhere else. Wait, and some little Austin, like almost as popular as. Um, as LA now. I yeah, have I didn't I, realize I, Austin was as big like, as it is Austin? Either. I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, Austin's become very popular and evidently it's huge. It's like the seventh biggest city in the country. Yeah. Oh, like and I think like I heard some crazy number that like five hundred thousand people move there every day or something. I don't know, like insane numbers of people move, leaving LA or leaving New York and going to Austin and that's how fast it's expanding. Mm. Yeah, I've heard it's nice, but I don't know if it's as hot as the rest of Texas. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, I, I, I shot wouldn't. there in um, June. Actually, it was like pretty much exactly a year ago now. Yeah. I was there and we were supposed to shoot there in early April. So I think the weather would have been much nicer. But for, for whatever reason, it got pushed back and we couldn't change the location. And I got heat stroke. <laughs> God, really? <laughs> I went blind for two hours and my poor producer, you know, Amy Whitehouse? Uh, I know her name. Uh, yeah, I think I've talked to her before. Ace out of Austin. She she was there taking care of me with like cold rags and stuff. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm like, just go on without me. Keep going. It'll be fine. It was fine. <laughs> How long were you out? Two hours. Really? Yeah. God. Damn. Yeah, that heat, man. It'll do it. My daughter, um, when well, she's twenty now, I guess she was probably sixteen at the time. She was playing sand volleyball, and. I had to leave in the middle of the, the tournament and my wife calls me up. It's like, you got to meet us at the um, emergency care. And I'm like, what happened? She goes, well, I was sitting there watching and I turned my head, looked another way and I heard a guy go, Hey, look at that big girl. She's about to fall over. Cause my daughter is <laughs> five, 11. Oh and, uh, my gosh. He's, she said, I turned around and looked and there was my daughter, Alexa, just like going, uh, and then about to hit the ground. She so she had gotten heat stroke was passing out. So yeah, yeah. I know it's not a fun thing to have to go through. No. And I, I just felt like so bad because I was leaving. I mean, my, the photographer I had on set was amazing and I didn't have to do anything. Like I didn't, I wasn't worried, but I just felt bad that I wasn't able to, you know, just be ready right. for anything that would go wrong. Luckily nothing did go wrong. It was great, but well, would not recommend. I also got in a pool. So one of our locations might've been that morning. Or maybe it was a day before the house had a, a little like waiting pool. And I just got in, in my clothes. I just sat in there and we were all sitting in our clothes on lunch break, just like in the pool, fully oh. dressed because <laughs> it was so hot. And by the afternoon, our clothes had dried because wow. it was that hot. It, is, it just evaporated. 
Yeah, I remember the first time I ever went there was to visit my aunt in Houston. And it was in June or July we went to see her. And I just remember walking out of the door from her apartment and it was horrific heat. Yeah, it hits you like a wall. Yeah, and I would not want to live there. Yeah. I don't want to be there and I don't want to be in Florida in the summer. No. Those are two places I would try I like to avoid if possible. Yeah. And where you're in North Carolina? Yeah, I'm in Charlotte. Okay. Uh, so I shoot in New York and LA and Miami all as local because I have crews and all those places and I have um, friends so that I stay yeah. with. But yeah, I'm, I'm based in North Carolina because my family's here. We thought about moving to New York, but <laughs> no. I mean, I can be in New York in five hours. If you called me, if you were in New York and you called me and said, hey, I need to meet with you today and it was 9 a.m., I'd be like, okay, give me five hey, hours and I'll be there. I guess you could have gotten a flight. Yeah. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Well, are now, but. <laughs> yeah. God, flights got cheap as hell for a while. I know. I I'm, almost like, was like, screw it. I might as well just buy a $200 ticket to some beautiful place and stay there for a little bit. Yeah, we thought about that too. It's like, my God, we can fly down to like South Beach for a hundred bucks a piece right now if we wanted to do yeah. that. But then we're like, nah. Although yeah. a friend of mine, an uh, orthopedic surgeon, was telling me about some, um, he's got some stuff they use they put in your nose now it's like not a swab you just put it just at the edge right up into your oh, nose oh yeah to test it to test for it no it's not even to test it he said this stuff is they use it on patients because they were getting every so many cases he does knee and hip replacements every mm-hmm. so many cases they you got a staph infection or the person oh. would get a staph infection because and somehow oh, yeah. hospital, i think you just get it it's yeah get it. but somehow he figured out that whatever was causing the staph infection had the same properties as a lot of what was in your nose. And so they don't know if it was going through your body from the inside and getting there, or people were doing like this and it was somehow, or what was happening. So there's, he's got some stuff. He says, you put in your nose and you use that. And he said, wear a mask. And like all the, st- he said, they do his patients, staph infections have disappeared. They don't get them at all anymore. And he said, and he thinks that it would work perfect for COVID too, because people touch their face like, once every four minutes or something like that. So mm-hmm. he's, he's going to give me some of that to try out on my next shoot. So we'll see. But he says it's, I'll have to find out what it is because he just told me he had some. He was going to give me samples of it. So we'll see if it all, all happens with that. But I mean, I, any, I would try anything at this point. Yeah. <laughs> He told me, he's like, if you get on a plane, he said, put this stuff on your nose, wear a mask, and just make sure you wash your hands. You'll be bulletproof. He said, you yeah. won't, you're not going to get it. But I heard the other day, somebody said you can get it through your eyeballs. I know. I saw some, I don't know if he was like a, a respiratory doctor or something, but it was ironic. Whoever it was, like, was going to, to another hospital to help out with it or, you know, was heavily involved medically. Yeah. And he ended up getting it in through his eyes, I guess, yeah. which I don't know how. Uh, yeah. I, about it. I no, I, there's no like reliable sources. Like one day somebody's saying, wear the mask. The other, the next day they're like, don't wear the mask. And you can get it from touching stuff. You can't get it from touching stuff. It's just like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to wear the mask and not touch things and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. My friend, uh, the, the surgeon, the doctor, he said, the little surgical mask said they don't help you. He said they're good to keep you from getting somebody else sick. He said, but they're not going to keep yeah. you from getting sick. They don't protect you. Yeah, it's yeah. about not spreading it. So that's why so this N95 sure. mask worked pretty well, though. He said those yeah. things will, will work for you. They are the most uncomfortable thing, though. I have one not from uh, developing film. Yeah. And I, I wore it like one day to the grocery store. And I, was like, I can't do this. It's not worth it. I'd rather get sick. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when it first started, I had two that I had for like when I worked in the yard and put out pine needles or whatever. And I put it on that whole having to put it over here and it just smashes up against your head. Yeah, and it presses like the bridge of your nose so hard. So uncomfortable. Yeah. My daughter, my youngest, was just in surgery with my friend and she was watching and the smell got to her. And he was, she was like, I don't know if I want to do that again. He was like, tell her to come back. We'll give her an N95. Nothing gets through those things and she'll be fine. Yeah. She was like, I don't know. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but we'll see if she does it or not. Yeah. So with things now, the way they are with everybody, you know, not shooting, how much are you getting? Cause I haven't 
shot anything and been paid since my last day on set was March 13th. Mm -hmm. How much are you just getting bombarded with promos from photographers oh and a lot and promos and like production companies will send like this is what we're doing to say in business and this is how we're adapting and this is how we're adjusting and i think it's great like you know of course you're going to do anything that you can to to keep business going um and i would love to give people business but i would say i get so many now and they all kind of say the same thing so yeah. i you know, if people ask, I'm honest and I say, don't spend time on it. If we, or at least specifically for, for my agency and some other agencies that I know, we know where you are. We know the people that we trust to work in these type of conditions. So we will reach out to you if we have a need. Like, I, right. I promise we know where to find you. Um, just because, like, it, don't spend time on something that's going to get lost in the mix. And yeah, I'm just, just trying to be honest about it. What has happened? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I've been with multiple art producers who I've seen just go, look, here's what I've gotten today from photographers or from reps. And then you see this list on their, oh, it's, yeah, I and wake I up to like to look at all that. 30 every morning and I don't look at them because yeah. I just can't. Yeah, I don't have I time, unfortunately. Tough. Do you just, I will say that if, and this is probably, pre COVID, but like if for some reason I had a specific need or like, you know, we want to work with somebody different. We want to work with somebody new. Don't send us the same links. Um, I will go back through my email and search like newsletter or whatever, whatever the key terms that people use to send yeah. like monthly or, or annual or whatever, um, promos, I will search back and sometimes I'll find, I'll come across one that like strikes me or, or sticks out. And I'll reach out to that person. So I, it, I guess it's not a total waste of effort, but it's definitely not my first go-to. Yeah, I would think not. I mean, because there are just so many. I don't know how you could sit there and go through yeah. them all. And Well, and that's what I, a lot of people ask me. I don't even know. It might have been you or somebody else asked me about Sourcebook. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. 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 Well, I, again, like I have several people ask me that question throughout the year. And I say, don't spend your money on it because – you get lost in the mix of like 200 pages of other photographers. Right. And I know a lot of people just don't have time to sit through and page through books. Yeah. I wondered how that was, how that was going. And my reps had been like, let's look into source books. And so that's why I was doing that. I was like, I don't know that they're worth because the art producers I know don't seem to use them. So I asked probably 12 different people that I know and three maybe came back and said that they do. Yeah. I mean, there, there's been out of my five years, there's been maybe two times where creatives have said, I'm really stumped. Do you have any books that I can just spend time looking through the old fashioned way and just like page through books until they, they see something that's like, wow. Um, so that has happened a few times, but again, definitely now, like my agency isn't going back this year. To the office yeah. so oh, you're not going back at all this year no oh wow um because they they feel we've been as efficient as before yeah so they're like why put people at risk which i appreciate and i, I oh, think that's it's great smart. yeah i just don't see creatives looking through books in the next couple months yeah probably <laughs> everything's not. just gonna be on the web now so how do you guys if you have a project come up and you don't just have a photographer come to mind immediately how do you guys find photographers uh, I always start with reps that I know or, you know, who have come in for portfolio reviews. And right. so before that was really helpful and important. Um, and I'll ask, I'll ask around usually first before I just go blindly to the internet. Yeah. Um, Instagram is a huge one for me. And yeah. I tell everyone that I love the fact that you can market yourself on Instagram without being obnoxious just yeah. by posting your beautiful work and who you are as a person. Cause I don't want to work with like a robot or somebody who's strange and not. How do you, you feel know? about the photographer's fee? Cause I've heard from different, listen to different podcasts and from different people. Some want to see all personal stuff. Some want to see just nothing but your actual work yeah. website. And some want to see a mix of both. Do you have a preference on that? I 
For me, I really like to see a mix of both because again, like when I have a production for a client, I want it to be a whole fun experience. I don't want it to just be about the work because that's how you establish a long-term relationship. It's it. Like they were really fun to work with and I know them as a human now, so I have a soft spot for them. And of course, I'm going to want to work with them again if, if it was successful and their work is beautiful. So, um, and for me personally, like it's, we all know it's a lot of hours to spend with somebody and a lot of money to risk and whatever. So I want to know that you're a fun person. I love to have fun on production. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't fun. So I want to know that you like dogs or you like ice cream or you like to go on bike rides or I don't know, whatever right. it is. Like it's a human experience, not just a work thing. Do you prefer, would you prefer that be put up in their stories or just in their feed or do you care? Um, I guess it doesn't matter, but anything, I think, I, I so think so many people spend so much time curating their, their page so that everything right. looks just so, and then I've seen other photographers and usually it's the guys who are at the top making a ton of cash, shooting all the big stuff. There's a lot of times there's just all over the place. There's no yeah, real I think curation like, to it. The curating is, is a lot of effort and, and I don't have time to like, look at your full page and analyze like, Oh my God, one square is totally different than I'm just going to scroll through and see what I see that day. So yeah. I think I definitely recommend posting uh, regularly on your actual feed and, and mixing it up so that like one day maybe I'll see a beautiful photo and then the next day I'll see like a funny haircut or like Peter Yang is a perfect example. He posts beautiful work, but then he just like posts these random funny pictures of like, I cut my hair in quarantine and I saved $35 or whatever. And right. that, I like, I looked at that and I was like, Oh my God, me too. And I texted him and we, we talked <laughs> just because I saw that picture that he cut his hair. Um, and stories I think are, are nice because it's just like easy brain candy that you can flip through. Yeah. So I think both are important. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. How do you feel about this is a, this is a random as hell thing that I heard some, <laughs> art producer talking about or they got a it was on instagram and i don't know if a photographer sent them this or not it was like but how do you feel about pictures in email so if somebody sends you an email and they embed an image into the email is that okay is that annoying is uh, i don't find it annoying um yeah. you know it doesn't hurt to do it yeah but I'll probably... like, don't do it but i was like i'll well, my thinking was, well, why not? It's just, unless it's like some huge thing that makes Yeah, I guess I would say work. don't like overload our inbox with a huge file just because either we won't be able to download it so we won't see it anyway or mm -hmm. it'll just like mess everything else up. But like, you know, a normal sized photo. I've never complained or been like, oh God, I wish they didn't put that photo. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what she was thinking unless maybe it was one of those afraid that they're going to put something overly offensive in there. And <laughs> yeah, or yeah, something, I guess. Maybe. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have any clue. You still get mailers? We were, yeah. Yeah. Which, um, for, for a while, I think it was, it was nice because I had a wall next to my desk where I would tape up the ones that I liked. Oh, you and actually have a wall. You, well, I mean, it was like the company wall, but oh, I just didn't care. Yeah. It was boring and bland, so I just started putting up promos that I liked. And I'd have creatives walk by sometimes and be like, "Oh, that's really nice." Who's you that? have an actual so, office or do you have just a little cubicle with a little... It was, it's like a open air cubicle. Like it wasn't like a cubicle where you couldn't see anybody, but right. a row and a wall and okay. not totally open concept, but. Well, hey, at least you got a wall. I know a lot yeah. of them have a wall. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that part is good. What do you wish that photographers or agents or whoever knew about what you do as a job and what you, maybe what in general we probably do to annoy you. Um, I mean, that's you just please a God stop doing that. question. And I'm only answering this with this answer because it, I've been dealing with it all day. Like I wish people, and maybe this isn't a thing that everyone can say because I, I, I'm not the same as other art producers. They're not the same as me. They, right. they run things however they want to run things. But I wish that, that they assumed I am absolutely 100% on their team. Like, I'm here for you guys. 
I have a duty to protect my client and my team, but I take my job seriously in the fact that I'm also protecting you guys. And like, I don't like half the stuff that I ask of people to do. I hate asking people to, to fit, fit things into a budget that I don't even agree with because I know it's not right, but we really want to make this happen. So how can we be more creative? How can we collaborate together? I'm not, I don't want a penny pinch. I don't like you guys are valuable and, and you're allowed to deter determine your own value. And I fight for that as much as I can on the other end. And you probably don't see that. You, I, I know a lot of people see me as like, Hey, I'm going to pay you this amount, no matter what the creative doubles. I don't care. You have to stick with, you know, whatever. Like I'm like the big bad budget setter. Um, and, and like all the processes that we have to go through, especially in pharmaceuticals, like there are so many restrictions. I hate them. I don't like them, but it's my job to take the restrictions and the creative and make it come to a nice little meet in the middle. And it is really hard to be in the middle because I get it from both sides. I understand. Yeah. I, bet. I always, I always thought of art producers, just the middleman that you are doing your thing and your job is to try and find the best team to do what the creative team is asking for yeah. And when you come back to me and go, well, we had it just um, the other week, uh, producer came back and was like, hey, we're having to redo this. The budget, that's just too high. We're going to knock out some images. I need you to redo the whole thing again because they just don't have the budget right now to do this. And I understood that and I didn't think it was her fault. I figured it was just. Yeah. You know, the yeah. Company. We're the, we're just the bad. We deliver bad news all the time. That's all we do. I have to deliver bad news to my creatives all the time, to my account people all the time, to the clients sometimes and back to you guys like nobody ever likes us <laughs> and I, so I'm like I just I love you all and I just want the best for everybody that's all I want well, that's and good. It's just, it, I would say it's a little bit of a thankless job a lot of times yeah that sucks. part I can see yeah. yeah do you have to deal with cost consultants there yeah a yeah. lot of them are really nice there's some difficult ones and I also like I get that they're in the same position I'm in like they don't they probably don't like to well, some of them might get joy out of it. I don't know. But they don't like to tell me, like, hey, you have to take 10000 off of this, the same way that I have to ask my photographers, right. like, you need to put this budget down. But it's their job, and they're, you know, they're being paid by our clients to do a thing, so they're just doing what they're being asked to do. So are they giving um, the budget from the client, and then they just kind of make sure it stays in that thing? Or how does uh, that work exactly? Do you know? I don't necessarily know the back end of it too much. Um, Usually what I do is I send bids and I say, how does this look for these circumstances? And sometimes they'll be like, it looks fine. Sometimes they'll even add stuff in and say like, I think you should, you know, bump this up or add more of this or add this thing. Um, and sometimes they'll say, I don't, this seems overkill. You need to take it out. Like, why would you need that? Right. And it's just kind of an ongoing discussion of like, well, we think we need it for this reason, whatever. And most of them are pretty understanding. That's good. Do yeah. you, as far as the rest of the team goes, say hair and makeup, clothing stylist, all that, do you rely on the photographer and the photographer rap producers to handle that? Or do you guys have say so or preferences on if, that? Uh, if we're working with a TV production company, I usually don't bother them. I usually let them do their thing. And like, we, we just take whatever we can get. Like you have a person on your set, we'll just use them. That's fine. Um, if I have any controller say, I definitely have people that I love and that yeah. even my clients have come to love just because they have grown to know them and work with them repeatedly. So if, where I can, I will request specific people. Um, producers, I definitely request specific people because they are truly, like the photographer is obviously very important, but the produ if you have a bad producer, the oh, whole absolutely. thing is a mess and it's just, you, you know, and they're, again, like they're, they're there for you and me. And if we don't have a good one, we're both screwed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've experienced really good producers and I've experienced some that did it's, not. It's life changing. If you have a bad one, it's like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. I, so. Yeah. There, there's one or two trips. Well, one trip that I had, it was out West and it was seven days and I hired a producer and the producer and the art director got into it. And that didn't go well because the art producer called back to the company and the company was called me and told me to handle the producer. So the producer, and then I found, and it was all over a location house. Yeah. And then I found out later after the shoot was over that the art director never even looked at the location house 
he had written an email saying he approved it. But then when he got there, yeah. raised hell, said this is not the house we were supposed it to be shooting at. Yeah, but he blamed it all on the producer, and then it all came back on me. So that wasn't a lot of fun. <laughs> but So tell me about – well, actually, let me before I get to that. Do you prefer the photographers have reps, or do, does it matter to you? I don't care. Um, I, I really don't have a preference. Again, like in that instance, I – rely heavily on the producer to make sure like if you don't have a rep that's totally fine but there are certain things that some some people just we have certain expectations versus like a, a different agency I don't know what McCann expects out of a production but we have certain expectations that we need to meet for our clients and usually I rely on the producer to handle and know that or right. the rep to handle and know that because the photographer should just focus on making the good creative and I don't want to add that stress and put you in a, a position where you won't be set up for success in that right. way. Yeah, well that's nice. That's good to hear. Okay, so last question. What is the strangest or most interesting thing that you've had happen to you in the last five years? <laughs> oh man, I don't know. <laughs> There's been so, I mean, I would say, the strangest thing that's happened to me is a huge production company took money that was owed to talent going on air and ran away with it. And it has made my life a living hell. Really? And I won't name anything because that's not fair, but I, I just like <laughs> waking up one day I can even fathom like oh my god what happened wow so they just took off a of cash. Of cash yeah they just i don't know what happened maybe they were in financial trouble or it's it, you know it's like a, a deep saga that i won't get into but um that was something i never thought i would have to deal with even though i'm sure it's not the first time it's ever happened in the production universe yeah Gosh, but I, I just, couldn't believe, like, seriously, <laughs> we trusted you with a lot of money and you just <laughs> disappeared. So who gets stuck having to pay everybody? You guys? We don't know. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> it's ongoing. I don't know. Well, I did hear years ago, there was a photographer in, out of uh, New Jersey and he had his first big shoot for some company. I don't remember the name of the company, but it was like, think he owed his crew and all like 30 grand or something. And the company filed for bankruptcy the day after the shoot ended. And I was like, sorry, we can't pay you. We don't oh have any money. For you. So he ended up stuck with like, I can't remember, it was either 15 or $30,000 worth of payments he had to make out to the crew. You know, he didn't have the money. Yeah. So it's, you're, you're not alone. And, yeah, on, a, yeah. on a smaller scale, I had a client years ago when I first started shooting. It was for prom dresses. And luckily, one of my friends had shot for them already the year before. So I'm shooting for him, and he told me, he's like, get the check and cash it immediately before you ever give them the, the images. Or give them the images and go and cash your check immediately because what's going to happen is they're going to come back to you, and they're going to complain about something. He said, because I sh he shot them in studio on Seamless, and they came back and said the seamless was the, a bad color. They didn't like it and needed him to reshoot the whole thing all over again. Mm -hmm. So for me, we shot in a location house. We, with a window kind of behind them where you could see outside and there was a cloudy overcast day. So no clouds in the sky. They come back to me and go, we couldn't see any detail in the sky. We need to reshoot everything. And I said, well, first of all, your art director was there and approved it all. Well, you should have known better. They're like, well, you should have known better than that. And so I had already cashed the check. So I was like, you know what? I'm not reshooting it for that, not for free. I'll reshoot it. You can pay me yeah. to reshoot it. Yeah. And they were just cheap all the way around. They didn't hire a clothing stylist. I ended up, I found out halfway through the shoot that they were making the models steam the clothes in the back, oh in the dresses. Yeah. So I had to put it into that. But yeah, so yeah, all I've kinds been, of stuff. I've been that person too. Yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, seamstress, st steamstress, uh, hair. And, I've been everything because the client did not want to put the money up 
for yeah. him. Yeah, sounds about right. But again, I'm a team player. I do all the things because yeah. I know that they are ridiculous things that we shouldn't have to do. I agree. I'm light stand. Actually, that's the, the money thing is not the strangest thing that's happened to me. I was on a set where there was zero budget. My employer photographer was allowed one assistant plus me. And the, the production was not handled smartly by the video team. So we really got the shaft and I ended up holding a, a flag, a light blocking flag. And we were outside in the middle of February and our talent was a real patient who was a cancer survivor. So we wanted to keep them warm, but the production company only supplied a propane tank with a live flame. So we had the, the <laughs> propane tank close enough where the patient could feel the heat, but obviously not putting them in danger. Yeah. But the way that the shot was set up after all the video crew bailed um, was that I needed to hold the stand or the flag or whatever it was in proximity to the propane tank. And I was leaning over like this Ooh. and my creative was like, Some, I smell something burning. And we all looked down and my hair was actually, it was probably about this long at that point. So oh like that long was on fire. And I like quickly went like this and it blew off. And I swear to God, this, I lost this much hair. And I came to work the next day with my hair cut here. And everyone was like, what the hell happened to you? And I was like, ah, my hair just lit on fire on set and blew away. So that's been a running joke at the agency. Yeah, I'd say. It was a traumatic. It took, that was in 2018, February of 2018 that happened. And it took this long to grow back. Wow. So that was the most interesting thing that's ever happened. Yeah, I'm going to say that was, that's pretty incredible. I've only seen hair catch on fire fire one time. And it was actually, I was in a bar in DC. And at the time I had hair down to here and the guy, I was with my makeup artist and the guy we were with, he had like hair halfway down his back. And I went up and I went to the bathroom and I came back out and they're at the bar and I see this thing go, (laughs) All these yeah. flames, and I was like, "What the hell is that? What are you guys drinking?" Like, no, it was my hair just caught on fire. There was a candle on the bar, and he had leaned over, and his hair just just went up. But yeah, that's I never heard anybody losing their hair on set. Yeah, and yeah. it's the worst smell in the world. Yeah. Oh my god. So, okay, yeah. so I saw your shirt. It says mom, dog, mom, dog, dog mom squared. Squared. Yeah. So you have two dogs. I saw. I, I know you have one. I have. I recently acquired a puppy right before quarantine which at first was very stressful and now like i don't know i would be so bored if i didn't have both of them to entertain me all day and like that's a big uh, thing right now everybody's getting puppies uh, yeah it's a good time to you know you're around all day to train it if you want what Um, kind of dogs they're blue healer cattle dog mixes yeah yeah or uh yeah blue healer cattle dog mixed with australian shepherd Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I remember seeing, I didn't know, if it's, do they look the same? Kind of. They look, they look like they could be related. Okay. Ironically, which I've had my older dog for six, coming on six years now. And obviously, I just got the puppy from a different rescue in um, March, February. Yeah, we're trying but, to find my father-in-law one. And it's, there, I mean, it's pain. I am all about rescuing like an older dog that's already trained and you know puppies are going to get adopted or purchased yeah. immediately so th- there's no problem getting rid of them i didn't actually want a puppy i did i was searching for an old uh, you know like a four-year-old dog or something but i just i saw her and i met her and i just knew that i had to get her so oh well that's good yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking for one for my father-in-law because we want something he's 72 or something so we're looking for something a little bit older, but it's hard to find. It's not just crazy, has some yeah. kind of medical issue, or it's not a um, pit bull Rottweiler or something. Yeah, which it's definitely, it's, wrestling is harder. It's harder to find the perfect match without the, you know, they all have baggage, which is sad, but yeah. um, you, you do, it's going to be a commitment. So obviously you don't want to just settle for, for a dog that you ultimately end up not being able to take care of. Yeah, we may end so up with a puppy. Tough. I don't know. My daughter's boyfriend, they're fostering a puppy right now, and he brought it over the other day. 
and it was really good. Got along with our dog well. Yeah. And uh, but they're not going to keep it. So oh, well, maybe he can adopt it. Yeah. So he's like, I'll take it. I'll take that. Let them do the hard work, foster it, train it, make it, you know, a, a responsible dog, and then just there you go. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, why don't you guys potty train that dog and then uh, yeah. take care of it. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. Thank you. It was fun. Glad we got to chat. Yeah, me too. Anybody watching, listening, if you guys want to, um, if you like it, thumbs up it, like it, share it, subscribe to it, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll keep doing it. So, But yeah, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Yeah.